Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts of the Week for October 5th, 2020. Please see our disclaimer for important information. Here in our weekly COVID tracker, you can see the trend of the seven-day daily moving average uh, in deaths, as well as uh, new caseloads. You can see that uh, we hit a little bit of an interim peak once we open schools and whatnot, and uh, good news is we see that rolling over just a little bit while we see the daily deaths continue to trend lower as uh, better therapies are uh, developed uh, and people understand the virus a little bit more and people are being treated uh, earlier in the uh, process. Uh, so good trends on, uh, on caseloads. We obviously want to see that number continue to trend lower. Here is our coronavirus high frequency data chart that comes to us by way of First Trust, uh, our friends in Chicago. Uh, you can see all of the indicators with the exception of rail car traffic uh, were positive over the last week. And uh, on a monthly basis, uh, we saw a little bit of chop in the uh, uh, supply of motor gasoline. Uh, we saw a little bit of uh, degradation in the numbers and hotel average daily rates. Uh, but mostly the data has been positive over the last month and certainly over the last week. Uh, and uh, probably particularly so in, in some of the uh, more manufacturing related things like uh, steel production uh, and, uh, and TSA checkpoint data uh, was very strong over the last week as well as uh, restaurant data. So Comcast has some information out that uh, I looked at over the, the, this past week, which I thought was pretty interesting. So. Uh, a simple question, how much is your revenue decline from a business owner's perspective as a result of COVID? And you can see that uh, only 14% had no impact and everybody else had some impact. Uh, most people had an impact of somewhere between negative 15 to negative 25%, but you can see that uh, there are folks that were clearly much more impacted than that. And those are likely the ones that are facing the most uh, issues with regard to viability and sustainability right now. In this chart, uh, respondents uh, being business owners were asked, uh, you know, when they think that they'll be able to return to normal. And so this was administered last month. And uh, it's, it's very striking to, to see that, uh, that there's still a, a very strong feeling that it's going to take zero to six months for a quarter of the respondents, as well as over a quarter of the respondents, six months uh, to uh, a year, as well as uh, more, more folks feeling like it's gonna take a year or more, which is really, really uh, heartfelt uh, in the sense that, uh, that really, I think the expectation is that we're not going to see this normalization uh, if there is more stimulus and help for small business owners, that we're not gonna see that number returned to its prior levels uh, for you know at least six months uh, to perhaps even uh, 12 to 15 months. Small business priorities. This is from Lending Tree, a uh, pretty interesting study that they had, uh, and it really just kind of brings uh, home this uh, the plight of a small business owner right now. And obviously, the, the it's kind of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You. You want to provide for your family, that's uh, paramount. Uh, paying off debt, uh, making up enough money uh, to, uh, to even break e even, those are the primary concerns. And then obviously, uh, you know, bringing back customers and, and employees, people uh, have great care for, but you know, just, you know, paying off debt and providing for family, you know, those, those needs that are paramount, they're very existential needs. Types of debt. This is uh, another interesting chart from Lending Tree, which kind of highlights the issue of what business owners are having to do to make ends meet here. So uh, while 26% of respondents in this survey uh, didn't take on any debt, uh, you can see that there's a lot of uh, avenues that people had to pursue just to keep the doors open. You know, whether it's credit card debt, which we saw a spike in usage, and now we understand that that's not on necessarily consumer purchases, th those, were, those were purchases to keep businesses afloat. And we can even see credit card charges begin, beginning to roll over now. But you know, borrowing from friends, business loans, personal loans, cash out refinance mortgages, and things like that, 
um, you know, was maybe 2%, but personal loans was certainly higher than, you know, might otherwise be the case if we weren't dealing with a pandemic and forced shutdowns, et cetera. Uh, but uh, you can see that, uh, you know, from, from these numbers that uh, people clearly, you know, did whatever they could to try to keep their doors open. This is a chart from Bloomberg that just takes a laser focus on the hospitality industry. And, you know, as you might imagine, uh, you know, the four shutdowns, the lack of business travel, uh, you know, curbs and personal travel and, and some continuing fears over the pandemic, you know, have cast a, a real strong pall over this uh, industry. And you can see, you know, the magnitude of this chart is, is in that black relative to the blue uh, and that, uh, you know, just uh, looking at California as an example that has essentially just under 6,000 uh, hotels of some sort. Uh, and this is uh, data from the American Hotel Lodging Association. So may not capture everybody, but at least the, uh, the AHLA's members. Uh, but you can see that almost 4,000 of the 6,000, if they don't receive stimulus, uh, that, that they may close uh, permanently. Uh, Texas is a, it's a similar situation as is the case in relative terms across uh, much of the, uh, the largest states in, in the union here. So this is a quick chart on payroll uh, and, and employment. And so, you know, it, it, it's just showing you in sequential terms kind of this build back in, in the labor market. And you can see where we were before we hit the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, that number was north of 150 million uh, employed. And, you know, the fact that we lost 22 million, and even though we've gained roughly half of that back, you know, those were the easiest gains. Those were, in, in many cases, the uh, employees that, uh, uh, you know, were coming back to industries that were literally shut down. Now, the problem here, and I think the heavy lifting that will take place here on out will be, you know, the the real core business decisions. You know, again, small business employees upwards of half the uh, half of the workforce, and so small business owners have to make business decisions on, you know, whether they can continue to operate. You know, what's their break even? How are how are they going to sustain themselves? And we know a lot of them are fearful, very fearful uh, of their existence and being able or having to shut permanently. And so, you know, even though we you know, kind of bought back a lot of this deficit in terms of these monthly gains. I think the gains uh, are going to be harder to come by uh, going forward. You can even see that number. You know, May was highly disruptive, but you had a very strong June number and each uh, sequential uh, employment number uh, henceforth through September uh, showed a sequential decline. And clearly we kind of, uh, you know, hit a, a, an interim ceiling, if you will, uh, on uh, on labor gains. So on spending, you know, we've talked about consumer spending. We know that uh, uh, spending has been very strong in the in the lower income cohorts, and there's been a lot more saving in the higher income cohorts. And this just breaks it down into its components. And you can see, you know, the red would be durable goods, and the, these are like washing machines and you know hot water heaters and you know, things like that, uh, you know, non-durable goods would, you know, be like consumer products that you would have delivered by Amazon and then services are, you know, essentially what it says there. But you can see that the spending in services has really been down uh, for the last several months while we've had an increase in durable goods, which is good for the manufacturing sector. Uh, non-durable goods, uh, obviously good in some respects for retail, but that's been the really the, the, the kind of the calling card for consumer spending over the last several months uh, as and, and these numbers are all relative to February. So uh, obviously, while the numbers in aggregate may have, uh, you know, may be positive, just obviously relative to February, they're, they're down and they're down mostly because of uh, services as people are uh, limiting their mobility. This is a chart uh, from DeMeo, and I thought it was really interesting. I was reading through this research piece. So, you know, 1999, obviously, we were dealing with a tech bubble. Uh, we were dealing with Pets.com and lots of companies going public that didn't even have a 
a business plan, let alone revenues. Uh, and so, you know, we had overall economic growth of 5%, uh, unemployment, which is under four, which is where we were at the beginning of this year. Uh, and then we had a very strong uh, IPO market for new issues and interest rates were over 5%. Uh, Fed, Fed funds rates and mortgage rates were almost 8%. So, you know, we were, you know, living high on the tail end uh, of, a, of a long expansion that we thought, frankly, was going to continue. So I remember a lot of rhetoric back in the late 90s was, you know, this is the new normal. And, uh, you know, a lot of magazines that are no longer in publication, you know, were touting the fact that this is this time it's different. Well, guess what? Uh, it, uh, it did roll over. Uh, and as we fast forward, essentially about 20 years, we can see, you know, where we are now is that GDP growth in the last quarter uh, was negative uh, 31%. Uh, we have still high unemployment. Like I said uh, in, the, uh, in the previous slide, that I think if that's going to be sticky, it's going to take us probably a couple of years uh, to retrace uh, where we were on unemployment previously. Uh, and so, you know, we still have strong technology stock uh, performance. Uh, we've had a great year for public offerings, not necessarily IPOs, but we've had these kind of back end, what they call these SPACs or special purpose acquisition companies. It's kind of a, a wonky term of, of saying that the companies are going public without the, without going through that traditional, uh, initial public offering uh, uh, route, but uh, needless to say, there's been a lot of activity there. Uh, we have uh, the interest rates that are going to be low uh, and remain low for quite some time. Mortgage rates that are continue, continue to be low and again, should still stay low for a while. And then, uh, and then we're tracking in a recession. Equity valuations, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the markets in general. And so this is data from uh, MSCI, uh, and it just shows you uh, this uh, uh, cyclically adjusted PE ratio. And that's, you know, that's just basically it's, it's giving you a long term, you know, like almost a rolling uh, 15 year uh, average of the U.S. market versus international developed and emerging markets. And you can see that, you know, basically, you know, that, that blue area represents the range of equity valuations in terms of price to earnings. Uh, and in the U.S. over the last 15 years, uh, you know, we've had valuations that have been as high as like 25 times earnings all the way down to roughly 16 and a half to 17 times. And, you know, the median is right there in the middle over 20. Uh, again, this is trailing. So where we are now is in that gray dot, and that's above that range. So just to kind of put a, a, a bow on this, this, this shows you that, you know, that, uh, you know, at the end of last year, uh, we were uh, showing dramatic uh, valuations out there in the market. I mean, above average valuations. Uh, and even though with all of this disruption that we've had this year, it continues to be uh, very high and really not too far off of where it was at the end of last year with all of these earnings adjustments. Now, conversely, you look at international development, you look at emerging markets that have had much lower historical valuations, uh, but you can see that the relative valuation to its trend line is actually pretty much in line, particularly with emerging markets, uh, that average valuations are really at the midpoint of where they've been over the last 15 years. and international developed markets are very close to that point and have actually cheapened up since the end of last year. So, uh, you know, while there may lack a strong catalyst uh, to unlock a lot of that value in international markets, uh, they are still nevertheless uh, much cheaper than uh, U.S. markets are. This is a busy chart and we've shown this before. Uh, it was updated through the first quarter last time, uh, but this is from JP Morgan Asset Management and just shows you the contribution of earnings growth uh, in, uh, in, in the market, you know, where it comes from. What, you know, there's margin expansion, there's revenue growth, there's companies that increase uh, or that manage their share count, you know, to help drive earnings. And, you know, I don't want to get caught up in all of the minutia of this, but just simply to say that, you know, what helps to drive 
earnings growth changes over time. And as you look in, you know, 2016, 17, and 18, obviously we had margin expansions, profits, corporate profits were expanding uh, at a continuing clip. And that changed in 2019. And we actually had margins that went down, uh, but we still had revenue growth. And we've, we've had revenue growth leading up into the beginning of this year uh, for several years. Uh, and, and as a result, you know, earnings uh, have been positive for that time. And obviously in the first quarter, uh, you know, the wheels came off the train and uh, we were down significantly because margins were down, profits were down, the businesses were highly disrupted, uh, publicly traded businesses were highly disrupted. And then in uh, 2000, uh, uh, well, excuse me, second quarter, uh, all of those reports that we saw in July at the beginning of August, again, we had more margin erosion uh, and you could really begin to see that revenue impact there. Now, you know, we do expect some of this to shift now uh, in the third quarter. You know, we're probably going to see in the reports that are coming uh, here over the coming weeks, you know, probably some continued revenue decline, but probably a little bit of, you know, uh, bottoming out there. Uh, but uh, still, margins are going to be very, uh, very compressed uh, for, for a while. Earnings growth estimates, uh, as no surprise, this is in the gray is the estimates uh, for 2020 that we had, uh, that, that we were looking at at the end of last year. And then, you know, this uh, green color represents the uh, numbers that we have now. And, and you can see uh, the, the heavy industry areas, the industrials, energy have taken the biggest hit in terms of estimated earnings, uh, even consumer and financial. Uh, overall, the S&P 500 expected earnings are down about 19%. Obviously, some areas like tech uh, and consumer sta staples and healthcare, really kind of the uh, tech and healthcare being the two leaders of the, the market uh, year to date, you know, are still looking at positive earnings this year, but not near, nearly as strong, perhaps, as they uh, were expecting at the beginning of this year. But, you know, clearly you can see where the market uh, impact is coming from in terms of the earnings uh, estimate erosion uh, that we were alluding to in the uh, uh, prior chart. So an interesting thing that we're monitoring here is that you've got stock performance and, and basically this is stock performance versus investor sentiment. And what's really interesting in this chart from FS investments, that's from data uh, generated by the American Association of Individual Investors, um, you know, the investor sentiment is actually kind of weak uh, and it's it's been weak all year, which, you know, in, in the heart of the pandemic, you'd expect that. But it's it's stayed weak, uh, maybe kind of modestly improved, but then got worse again. And we're no better than where we were kind of, you know, uh, in April and May, uh, to be honest with you, which is really interesting, which it's kind of the individual investors are not nearly as bullish. Uh, as perhaps some corporate executives are and perhaps, uh, you know, some in institutional investors. But meanwhile, the stock market uh, continued to go up. And even though it's, you know, September, we had a little bit of a correction in the market. Uh, you can still see this very odd and unusual uh, divergence here, which seems to have only gotten wider uh, here in the last several months. Bonds versus stocks, uh, I think it's a, fair to say that we see less volatility in the bond market, which is, you know, what you'd expect to see, even though uh, bonds took a hit when we began to worry about credit worthiness, you know, as the pandemic really took hold uh, in this chart that kind of takes us from January through uh, where we are, uh, or pretty much at the end of September. Uh, but equities corrected a little bit, but we still had uh, treasuries. Uh, we still had overall bonds as represented here by the PIMCO total return bond fund, you know, still really kind of hold their heads. So e even amidst this equity volatility, if you get past April and May, you know, equities have come up, but bonds have really kind of held their head uh, in there quite a bit with this uh, drive towards uh, lower interest rates. flows across the asset classes. And this is interesting. So we've seen bonds in that previous chart kind of hold their head while stocks have really, really done well. Well, what's really interesting here is that uh, 
you know, we have had uh, very strong fixed income flows. Uh, and this takes us from basically the middle of June through uh, several, um, uh, through uh, basically the last week of last month. And in every instance, uh, you've seen greater uh, fixed income flows than, than equity, uh, save probably uh, the middle of September, we had that one blip, but, you know, but by and large, we've seen fund outflows wow. from equity, consistent outflows and relatively consistent inflows into fixed income. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to note that we've had a relatively strong equity market um, despite outflows, net outflows from equity. So this is something that we're going to monitor here, and this is just a, basically a debt ratio for uh, for the corporate uh, market, uh, and it just shows you that you know by hook or crook, you know you've had companies that have taken their commercial paper lines and, and turned them out. Basically, they've tapped their working capital lines. They've done everything they could to kind of build up their reserve of seed corn that they may have to use if we hit a recession environment. What's interesting is that net debt to EBITDA ratio, which is basically net debt to operating profits, has continued to go up. And it didn't just start in the pandemic. It actually started in 2018. Uh, and it's been well, uh, well entrenched as a trend uh, for the last couple of years. So, you know, we have what this means essentially is that we have uh, greater uh, indebtedness. Uh, but uh, at, at the same time, you know, we have pretty decent uh, interest coverage, which means a company's ability to pay its debt. Um, and that comes from greater profits. And we'll have to see when this uh, chart gets updated uh, in about another six months, you know, what happens to that line. But, you know, so far, greater indebtedness has not been a tremendous liability for most companies. And But it, obviously, the ones that are pro perhaps a little bit more stressed uh, financially as a result of the coronavirus you know, are going to be, uh, you know, are, are going to be much more impacted uh, in, in, by overall indebtedness. So we're going to talk about inflation um, for a couple of charts here. And this is uh, the first chart that I'll show. And this is money supply, what they call M2 money stock. And this is, you know, data from the, uh, it's compiled by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And no surprise, you're in a pandemic, uh, the government's uh, doing what it can on fiscal policy, and the Federal Reserve has done a lot on monetary policy. Uh, you know, they've gone out and quantitatively eased by buying assets. Uh, they've been very vocal about this, and you can see the impact uh, on, uh, this is a percent change uh, year over year, and you can see the tremendous increase in response to the pandemic you know, but usually, and I show this as a, like a as a prelude uh, to these other charts because usually this is the mother's milk for inflation. When you increase the money supply at the rate at which we have done uh, this year, that you would typically expect in traditional economics to have that translate into increased velocity, which you know again is more money chasing fewer goods, which is your basically your boldest definition of inflation. So inflation expectations, and this is 2019 uh, versus 2020 uh, forecasts. In 2019, um, you know, here in the U.S., and I'll just focus on this, although there's data for a lot of different uh, entities. You can see China and Brazil uh, have inflation rates that are higher than ours. Um, but, you know, you can see in 2019, the expectation um, uh, excuse me, not the X, but the inflation that we saw was 1.8%. Uh, and the pandemic uh, infused uh, 2020, we've actually had a fair amount of disinflation, as have other major developed countries that you see below. Uh, but uh, basically, our inflation rates have been cut in half. So again, you know, the prior slide we saw, the feedstock is there for inflation, uh, but we can see the forecast uh, for uh, for realized inflation uh, being half of where they uh, were, um, you know, a, a year ago. 
In this slide, we kind of examine briefly uh, the difference in uh, equity returns when you have different levels of inflation. And so, you know, back in the uh, 1970s, uh, again, you know, we were dealing with the oil, uh, the OPEC embargo. We were dealing with hyperinflation towards the end of the 70s and early 80s. Um, and, and we really had kind of a stagflation environment where we weren't generating a lot of growth, but we had inflation. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the nominal return in the market uh, was uh, 5.6. But then, you know, if you add in inflation, the real returns were actually negative for that entire decade. And so, you know, that's a higher inflation uh, environment. Uh, but when, you know, you get past that, 1982 was kind of the seminal turning point uh, in, in interest rates. And we've had the secular decline in interest rates that have been kind of really underscored by a decline in the trend line inflation rate. Now, you know, in financial planning terms, people usually kind of point at 3% as kind of a uh, kind of an average uh, inflation um, you know, rate to use, but that number has actually been somewhat lower than that uh, since 1982, and it's continued to go down. Uh, and you, you can see that, that uh, equity returns have actually been much stronger in that environment. So the degree to which we can keep inflation low uh, should bode well for, for equity returns, which here, you know, over that average has been 11.2%, uh, with real returns being just over 8%. How inflation impacts portfolio returns, I think, you know, the, the, the data and maybe the actual dollars, you know, should mean less than really what these trend lines represent. And if you take, you know, your starting point is $100 that, you know, if you have a, you know, a nominal uh, return, uh, which it really reflects, you know, doesn't include interest rate, you know, you're going to have 200 by uh, year 10, which is almost the, the rule of 72, if you will. Uh, but um, if, if you add in a 5% real return, so you, you, you tax that 7% nominal return with 2% inflation, uh, then what you get is something that's probably, you know, uh, $40 less. So you go from 100 to, uh, to 160, 165. And then if you tax it further with 5% inflation and then hyperinflation, which would be, you know, 10% inflation, you could see that you know, after roughly about you know six to seven seven percent inflation, that you actually you know erode your uh, uh, corpus over time, uh, despite you know having a nominal return, that your real purchasing power uh, is eroded over time. And so you know, obviously we have we we it's going to take a lot for us to get to six to seven percent inflation, uh, but you know, really, I just present this to kind of highlight the fact or highlight the impact that inflation has on uh, nominal returns in the market. A couple of interesting charts as we kind of near the end of the deck here. Uh, this is a oil uh, energy usage outlook. Uh, and what's really poignant here is that, you know, since roughly 1995, uh, you know, we've had a continued increase in the, in the use uh, and consumption of oil, uh, and this is global. So where we are now uh, in our life cycle as we head towards, you know, 2050, which seems so long from now, but again, you know, we were sitting around in 1990 thinking, you know, gosh, 2020 is like forever long away, and then here we are, snap of the finger. You know, and, and as we fast forward another 30 years, you know, what's really clear in these forecasts is that we're going to have less consumption, you know, more you know, in, influence from renewables and electrics and all of these uh, electric vehicle companies that are going public uh, this year and getting a lot of press. You know, there's a lot of development, a lot of venture cap and private equity money that's chasing these things. And what it's really doing is, is having an impact on the expected uh, consumption of oil uh, as we look out, not just, you know, uh, over the next year or so, but over kind of a secular trend line over 20, 30 years. And on our last uh, slide, uh, you know, something that it really kind of, I think, tugs at my heart a little bit because I, when I saw this, my, I, I kind of, uh, it, it was a very sobering slide, very sobering data point. I think we should all take stock in this. Uh, 
again, not making a political point here, but just highlighting these trend lines. This is basically, it's a questionnaire. Uh, it's, it's sourced by YouGov and Voter Study Group and NationScape. Uh, it's information that's compiled, you know, across the partisan divide. So both Democrats and Republicans. And, you know, whereas, you know, even at 8% back in 2017 that said, that uh, it would be justified to use violence in advancing part of political goals. Um, and, um, and, th and this is, you know, percent an answering yes. And even 8% is troubling in and of itself that we have that many people in this country that would be inclined to use violence. But you, you see that, you know, throughout the pandemic and throughout, you know, all of the social unrest that we've had, that those numbers have really spiked uh, and I think this is something that we should all keep on our conscience. Again, not to, you know, wax uh, politico here, but uh, but just something that I thought was very uh, uh, very interesting and, and and stood out for its uh, uh, for you know for that that stood out to me. Well, that will do it for this week. I appreciate your comments uh, and your questions uh, to the information provided. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as always, be safe, have a great week, and look forward to talking to you again soon.